Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on business support and recovery, where I'm joined by the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Fair Work and Culture, Ms Fiona Hissel. I'm conscious that a few people are still joining the webinar, so I'll quickly run through some housekeeping. Everyone's been placed on mute to avoid background noise, and we will record the session to make it available later. We've been taking questions in advance of the session, and thank you for those. It was great to see so many come in, and while we may not have time to cover every question we received, we will follow up with links to appropriate resources and share feedback from the session with local government, Scottish government, and our business support partners. Our Business Gateway representative will be tweeting insights live from the Business Gateway Twitter account during the session. And as we all know, businesses are facing significant challenges as a result of the pandemic. And despite this, they've shown incredible resilience, innovation, and adaptability in the face of extreme uncertainty. The virus, as we know, does not respect borders, sectors, holidays, Christmas, weddings, or funerals, and tackling it has been a priority for our public health services over the last nine months. This has, as we all know, resulted in a number of shutdowns as we limit gatherings and contact with others. For businesses, this has posed a number of difficulties as they navigate uncertain waters to survive the crisis. As one of Scottish Government's business support partners, we are acutely aware of this, and our local government and business gateway advisors have been working across the country in partnership with other agencies to deliver vital grants and funding to firms so that they are able to make it through this crisis. We're grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving us time out of our busy schedule to join us for this session, where we will briefly reflect on what the last nine months have been like, how Scotland might look to recover economically post-pandemic, and how Scottish Government is working to support businesses all over the country over the coming weeks before we move on to your questions. Cabinet Secretary, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh, and good afternoon, everyone. And I very much welcome the opportunity uh, to speak to you all directly about the work we're doing to support businesses through this difficult and challenging time and to discuss our plans for Scotland's uh, economic recovery and obviously hear from you and, and, your and answer your questions. The coronavirus, as we know, result, obviously has started as a health crisis, uh, but obviously has quickly become an economic one. Uh, everyone's had to make significant changes to the way that we live and are living in order to keep the virus under control. And I know that businesses have made many sacrifices over this last year, and I want to thank you for what you're doing to help keep us all safe. The Scottish Government is continuing to do everything possible to assist. Uh, there's been to date uh, £2.3 billion committed in that initial economic response. Uh, in recent weeks, we've invested a further £93 million in recent packages of business support to help mitigate some of the financial challenges. And later this afternoon, and I'm afraid the timing means I can't really uh, be clear the, the information, but I will try and give you some sphere. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Kate Forbes, will provide an update on the 2020-21 uh, budget position, but she's also including an announcement on a winter package of business support. And I know that uh, Business Gateway Advisors have worked with other agencies to help deliver this support, and we really appreciate everything that's been done. It's been quite remarkable how we've managed, and obviously with our local government uh, colleagues, to help support. And uh, you know, obviously there have been frustrations along the way, but obviously managed, I think, at, um, at great speed to to help support businesses with brand new packages of support that previously would have taken months and months to deliver. Uh, this week has been a significant milestone in our fight against the virus with that initial stages of the vaccination program getting underway. I think my, my constituent was one of the, the medics that got the first uh, vaccination. Um, and while this gives hope for the future, there is still a, a long road ahead and it will be a complicated process. We'll have to continue to live with the impacts of the pandemic for some time to come. At the end of the Brexit implementation period with will further uh, obviously exacerbate these issues and, and we still as we speak unless anybody's got intelligence they'd like to share with me uh, we're not quite aware if there will be a deal and uh, obviously in terms of a deal if there is a deal uh, for many businesses uh, it will be important to help build a greater resilience over the next few months and uh, this will support a period of living with the virus uh, finding that effective balance uh, that allows for our economy to continue to re-emerge and grow whilst adhering the necessary public health measures. 
And while considering the current climate, it is essential that we keep the longer term future firmly in our minds. Uh, I do believe that we can rebuild back in a, a better way, uh, a greener, fairer and well-being economy uh, that makes the best use of our skills and also in digital and new technologies. And I'll be able to set more out about our plans during discussion. Uh, but recent announcements pledging more than 11 million pounds to help SMEs adopt digital technologies and improve digital capability and the, obviously the opening of the Scottish National Investment Bank are all things which all helps us to focus on that transition to net zero. Uh, and I think that hopefully will make our intentions clear of our direction for recovery. So there's never been a more crucial time for government uh, and business to engage on issues facing our economy. I value your input and your perspectives greatly. And I hope that we'll be able to take something from today's discussions as we look forward uh, and plan the next stages of our economic recovery. Thank you very much, Hugh, and I am very keen to hear uh, the, the feedback and also uh, any questions and try and answer any questions that uh, those that are now on. I think there's now 167 that I can see in the line uh, as we yeah. speak. So yeah, we've got, we've got a good number there. Thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think probably get on to the questions as you, as you say, but but you know some really interesting points you've made there and a little trailer for something perhaps later on. So we'll, we'll look forward to hearing more detail on that. Um, you kind of mentioned this, this year's seen significant changes in how many businesses and individuals work. Uh, that may be from home or remote working, and also in terms of the levels of support to business from government. Do you think some of these changes are here to stay? And do these create opportunities for Scottish businesses? I mean, I think that we should recognise there's no way that we're going back, and neither should we, to, I suppose, an old, old normal. I think a lot of businesses trying to survive will, would obviously gratefully try and go back uh, to this time next year. But I think in reality, we, we know the world's changed. And, and, and some of the things that the adaptations that have been made, I think, are here to stay. So, so how do we sort of build that for the future? Uh, we know that Prior to COVID, there was about 4% of people working from home. We now um, think it's about 24%. And most companies, uh, particularly that are office-based, know that they're not going to go back to the way things were, but they want to adapt, have a hybrid model um, of, of working. Clearly, there's been a great deal of uh, digital adaptation. Some companies have done more um, in five months uh, than they, would, they were planning to do over the next five years. So that shift, uh, particularly in digital, has made a, made a point. And also, I think for small businesses, particularly uh, in, in, in our towns, that kind of shift online uh, is something that they may want to, to, to continue and, and support the, their area. So some of these things will, will obviously be, be for the longer term. We have started work with the Scottish Chamber of Commerce and also uh, the trade unions looking at, well, look, you know, what does a safe return and a phased return uh, and to office-based working look like? Um, and we're obviously still going to continue looking at that. There's a lot of issues around mental health and well-being. We are social animals, so we obviously uh, need to, to work with each other. And also that kind of point about networking, creativity. Yeah, we can find webinars and different ways of doing that. But actually, people-to-people, -people, creativity and network is so important for business. So how do we do that in, in, in a modern way and how do we do it in a future way? But I think if we don't grasp this opportunity to make big strides and change, um, that will be a lost opportunity. And particularly if we commit ourselves to going uh, further on that uh, agenda on climate change, I mean, the climate crisis has not gone away, but I think our tools and our mission, and if we use that as a recovery tool for green recovery, then that can help us. And that's why a lot of the budget information and the program for government is about how to help businesses to decarbonize themselves and also become part of the, the solution in terms of the, the products that we will need as well. Just on that, do you think there's implications for town centres if there's more remote working or home working? Yeah, yes, I, yes, I, I do. I mean, actually, the converse means that there's a real issue for city centres or inner city centres, I want to add. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. We've just had a session with the, the number of ministers on it. We meet on a weekly basis on a Wednesday. Um, in my view, all ministers have got an economic uh, interest, but we have a specific ministers that meet together. We've just been discussing with Professor Lee Sparks uh, the forthcoming town centre action plan. I would, I would encourage everyone on this to keep an eye out for that. I think it'll it'll be um, finished soon. It'll be published more widely. 
Um, and I think it absolutely does, because people have had a sense of localism, a sense of place. Um, in, in our programme for government, we've set down a commitment for you know, a, a, the, the 20 minute neighbourhood to, to ensure that you know, we can have that approach. And I, I represent West Lothian and uh, I describe, or half of West Lothian, I don't have Livingston, but I describe my constituency as five towns and lots of villages. And there are more people live between Glasgow and Edinburgh than live in Glasgow and Edinburgh added together. And when you think about that, you know, Scotland is a country of towns, and therefore I think there is an opportunity to breathe more life uh, back into towns, but in a different way. It might well mean that we have to, to consider you know, that balance between living because and, and working because retail needs football, uh, but it's also the experience uh, of shopping as well. And so I think there's, there's something around that about how can we rethink our towns. And I think the Town Centre Action Plan was always really important, but I think even more so now, and how we can support that through planning and through and supporting businesses. I Even before, uh, before uh, lockdown, I was looking at some of the issues around commuting and trying to reduce how can you reduce uh, you know, carbon footprints. And the idea of having some kind of uh, centre where businesses could hot desk uh, we've obviously known there's, there's, there's private enterprises in this area and a lot of the creative hubs, the tech hubs, that kind of operation. But how do you do that for everybody? So they could go somewhere and um, they could work from home, but maybe uh, you know, on occasion be able to book into the hot desk area. People's uh, companies now, many of their um, systems are, are much more uh, secure than they were previously from a cyber security point of view. So they could go and hot desk elsewhere. And then you could maybe have a, within your town centre a place that people could go and work, have well-being sessions, you know, you name it, a lunchtime network, people, but also importantly, spend money in the city and in the town centre. So these things were on our horizon uh, prior to COVID, but I think it might accelerate it more in terms of our thinking. Yeah. And obviously technology is going to play an important part here in, in being able to deliver so much of that. Technology was forecast to be the fastest growing sector in Scotland by 2024. Do you think that's still possible despite the pandemic? Yes, and if you look at the um, responses in that sector, they, they see that. And uh, it's one of the areas that has come through this in, 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 in a, a, probably a stronger trajectory. Uh, Scotland IS, which is a representative body in digital, has said that uh, almost 80% of their respondents uh, are either optimistic or very optimistic about the future. Uh, we know, and you know, people may not, uh, I suppose, relate to these figures, but this is the case, is a fifth of the workforce in the Glasgow and Edinburgh are now employed in the tech sector. The 70,000 jobs were advertised last year. The real challenge there is, is, is uh, recruitment, and that's why part of the recovery is how do you help people uh, retrain and reskill for what is a real ask, and um, particularly in the digital area. And uh, you know, I think in terms of startups, we've also seen people shifting and moving. Uh, sometimes they're just making that decision that they want to shift into startups. So some of our business support has been about um, early stage growth companies to make sure that we can help support those of the companies um, that will help drive economic recovery. So early stage growth support has been really important as well. And of course, the Mark Logan report, and if you haven't had a chance, it's, it really is a, it, you know, it's well argued, presented, gives a real vision and also practical application of what we need. The Mark Logan uh, review of the Scottish tech sector, um, I think is really important because it does give us that route to how we can become a world-class tech sector, servicing, whether it's FinTech, servicing other areas, important in and of itself. And that's also why, in terms of supporting business, in the summer, very early on, we doubled the digital boost um, funding to help small businesses in particular uh, capitalise on what they could do in terms of digital support. And as I, I think I said in my opening remarks, we've also announced another £12 million in that area because we really see this as a way of helping our SMEs shift and move. And, and also reflecting that, I, I was very struck in talking to those uh, companies that continued to work through lockdown because they were essential and they possibly didn't have the same opportunity to do that shift in terms of digital investment that those companies that had to remain closed during that March, April, May period. So there's something about making sure that those companies that were working flat out even during lockdown can help have that digital shift as well. No, absolutely and, and, and the extra resource for, for digital boost is very welcome. 
it's a programme that's very well received by businesses and, and, and we, we will keep delivering that. You, you touched earlier on green recovery and you've made it very clear that the Scottish Government remains committed to a green economic recovery, even despite these challenges of COVID. Do you believe that the, the um, conference next year, the Convention of the Parties in uh, 26 in Glasgow, will create opportunities to highlight Scotland's skills and knowledge base in this area? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, and it's not just the, the holding of COP26, it's the lead up to COP26 and what comes out of that. And obviously, during the meeting itself, the UN will take over, there'll be the negotiations, um, there'll be everybody will want to advertise what they, what, what they have and what they're capable of. But if you look at Scotland's um, renewables, if you look at um, what we can do in terms of hydrogen, we've got hydrogen buses running. Uh, if you look at our uh, approach, our targets, are we leading um, the 75% target by 2030? You know, shows that we mean business on this. And in terms of the opportunities there uh, to, to demonstrate a capability, but it's really important that we support SMEs through this. And we also use, and a very important uh, part of our recovery is our uh, young persons uh, guarantee. I would ask anybody here, if you're looking to try and help develop your skills base, use the the capabilities of young people in your business. There'll be the support available for taking on young people. We want to combine it with the kickstart and talking to the Secretary of State, um, I think, tomorrow about that. Um, but you know, young people can help us in that area as well. We want to train them, particularly on the green jobs agenda, because we know from an energy point of view, if we're going to have all these district heating sectors, if we're going to be making sure that we're retrofitting buildings uh, with heat pumps, if we're making sure we've got that shift, then that's a, a, a huge opportunity for economic growth as well and green jobs. And COP26 is uh, a great advert for Scotland, so we've got to use it and make sure that we broadcast to the world what we as a country are capable because we have got it, what world it takes. And, and I guess what you're kind of saying there really is that we, we, we have a competitive edge now and in the future in, in those kind of areas of, of energy, renewables, that kind of thing. Yeah, and we've got you know currently three billion pounds worth of a, a green a, a green project prospectus trying to attract inward investors to, to come in and invest in Scotland in those areas. We've done the work uh, with our enterprise agencies to to marshal what that proposition is. Uh, we know increasingly there'll be a, um, a lot of green investment uh, companies, uh, pension funds, potentially others looking for uh, investment opportunities, and if we maximise. Obviously, with the Scottish National Investment Bank, uh, the mission-based approach they have, I think we can get that major investment as well. But we have to think about Scotland's competitive edge, our food and drink. That's why just last week there was an additional £5 million to help food and drink in terms of what they're facing, yes, through COVID, but also to support them in, in the eye of the, the storm in relation to EU exit. Uh, but we have so many different sectors, whether it's in financial services, the space sector, advanced manufacturing, uh, renewables digital, that's quite a kind of uh, diverse, and I think that's important for resilience, a diverse uh, sector base for Scotland in terms of the economy. And I think that will stand as in good stead for that economic recovery. Absolutely. Um, just kind of thinking about the kind of questions we've we've had come in, uh, as I say, thanks to everyone who, who sent us one. The majority, not unsurprisingly, have focused on business support. and. Obviously, we can't go into the specifics of every case, but we have the opportunity here to perhaps explain the overall approach from, from the Scottish Government. So the, the, the kind of first three questions are all kind of uh, around about the same kind of area. Um, John Doherty, who runs a coach business, has asked if there will be any specific support for this sector. And similarly, Alistair Jeffs, who runs Highland Spirit Bed and Breakfast, has asked if the small business grant support grant could be extended to domestic rate paying uh, bed and breakfast. I, I think possibly what Alistair's meaning there is, is uh, council tax paying uh, B&Bs. Yeah. And we've also been asked if self-catering businesses who are not in level four areas and therefore don't qualify for funding through the strategic framework business support fund, but have been impacted by travel restrictions will receive any further support? What, what's your thinking across those those three questions? So some, some of those areas have already received funding. And uh, uh, for example, bed and breakfast in that situation, three million pounds of support previously. 
Um, coaches, I know, have got real is issues because in terms of that inward bound uh, tourism sector, uh, but obviously coaches can be used in different ways. One of the first things actually I did um, from a constituency point of view, uh, which helped, I think, influence uh, swift movement by our education uh, secretary, uh, the DFM, in, in, in working with councils was to ensure that all the contracts were honoured from March up until the summer for uh, school, co school, school use of coaches, because obviously that was uh, very important for that sector. But can I reassure all three areas, uh, coaches, B&B um, with uh, domestic rates, and also self-catering that are not uh, in level four areas, but are impacted from that, that they should be hopeful that the announcement this afternoon and the, the detail which will come, uh, I hope, very quickly from that, because obviously people um, need, need to plan their own resources and finances, that there will be good news uh, for those areas. And can I just say, I know this is not about replacing income. None of this can help replace lost income, but it is about trying to help you survive and get through so we can build into recovery. But I hope we, hopefully that will give you some reassurance. I know it's a long time coming. And I know there's been uh, obviously concerns around it, Clearly, in terms of our, our financing as a, a Scottish government, we have to, to, to live within the means that we have. Uh, we can't borrow in the way the UK government uh, can do, or indeed offset and obviously use the, uh, the, the, the use of the Bank of England in terms of that generation of the additional financing. So the UK government is currently, I think, a trillion in terms of debt. Um, but in terms of the provision, the £1 billion consequentials that, that were only a few weeks uh, ago announced, remember, that was from a delay from an autumn budget statement that was meant to take place. So the Chancellor had three months to prepare on that. We've had a couple of weeks to try and make sure we marshal those additional resources, particularly into business support, but it can't be completely because we know we'll need some of that funding for health needs and indeed potentially other uh, EU exit disruptive uh, business uh, uh, requirements in the January to April uh, period. But I can reassure you that we have been listening. Uh, there'll be a major tourism and hospitality announcement uh, by Fergus Ewing on the back of the, uh, the, the statement for the winter business support package from Cape Forbes. But those uh, three specific areas, um, you should be pleased with what you're, you hear in the next few days. And, uh, and hopefully the payments, as I said, will, will, will follow uh, soon after, because I know we announce things, but you need to get them processed. And as I said, we're working very closely with councils who are under a lot of pressure, issuing a lot of the regular strategic framework business support grants, and what you're hearing uh, today will be on top of that. Okay, that's, that's good. Um, business rates and support for the self-employed company directors have also generated questions. Uh, Liv Barber runs a, a walking tour company, and she'd like to know if there are any plans to support businesses who don't pay rates because they don't have physical premises. Yeah. So uh, th this has been a challenge throughout COVID. Obviously, these are uh, genuine businesses that, that need support. And um, the newly self, the, so the UK government obviously had the self-employed scheme. Uh, what we did was we were conscious that there were people who were newly self-employed, and so therefore we ran a first tranche of funding uh, back earlier on uh, during the pandemic. And we've also released another £50 million that will go to councils uh, and they will reopen uh, that newly self-employed scheme. Um, one of the issues, and it's really hard to say this to people that are, that are genuine businesses themselves, you'll hear more and more about fraud. And unfortunately, I think you see that you're already seeing some of the stories around, around that through the furlough aspect and, and misuse by some of that. And therefore, the domestic rates and being registered for domestic rates is, is, is a very secure way for councils to give money that to, to companies that have got that track um, record and that and, and recognizable. And obviously, uh, people who have businesses that don't have premises, it's more problematic. However, what we can do, and, and local councils know, um, and the Business Gateway uh, itself uh, will know their local businesses much better than any, any central scheme will do. So therefore, the discretionary fund that's been provided, and that's 30 million pounds that is going out to councils as we speak, that will allow councils to target their funding to the businesses they know are, are not fitting the, the models or the sectoral models that we've had. So I'm a bit more hopeful that a bit more intelligence and responsiveness will be able to help the, the sort of company you just talked about, which is walking tours, which everybody will know about is genuine, but the idea of um, sending funding into people's personal bank accounts causes issues. Uh, so therefore, the 
evidence of bank accounts, uh, business bank accounts is really important. But I know that also brings some of the issues. One of the things we're also trying to do as part of equity recovery is make sure the banks start to, to help support new businesses uh, and with new business bank accounts as well. So that's another area. Okay. Uh, just on that point there about uh, so much of the support has been based on, on the rate system. We, we've been asked a question if there are any plans to change the rate system. Uh, Mark McKenna, who's a car retailer from Fife, has suggested moving to a local employment tax based on value generation rather than building values. Is this something the government would consider? Well, I've got to be very careful. I, I'm, I, thankfully, I'm not in charge of the rate system. I can ha hand that over to my colleagues, the Minister for Finance, Ben McPherson, and the Cabinet Secretary for Kate Forbes. But I do appreciate the challenges that the rate system has, has for people. Uh, we've obviously had the Barclay Review, uh, which we're in the process, obviously, of, of, of implementing. Uh, but I think I, I, I've got to be careful, especially if you're recording this. Now this might be used. <laughs> if I can the evidence. Maybe, maybe more circumspect. I do think people might want to think about different ways of looking at things. We've had debates in the Parliament before about land value, and I suppose it's where value is generated. And I think the, the point about the question is really thoughtful, because what is it that's important to us? What is it that we actually value? And if jobs, in a, and we've set out as part of recovery, our recovery is a national mission for jobs, then you know the value of, of contribution to jobs is really important. So um, I think that's a kind of point where uh, you know, is there a balance? And, and of course, if you think about it, remember the question about city centres, uh, where obviously you've got a bulk of maybe large numbers of thousands of people uh, being uh, being employed. Uh, clearly, the rate system, because city centres tend to be you know, higher rates. Uh, actually balanced out the number of people that are employed, but obviously if we've got different ways of where businesses is, is conducted, then obviously the wealth generation that can be then used to to, to reinvest into local areas ha has to be thought through. So I'm I'm probably giving you a politician's answer of not trying to overcommit it on something, but I do think you know thinking differently is what the future will and uh, what will be we will have to expect. So, but I'm not I, no immediate term. Um, uh, plans to change the, the rate system, but obviously I think that's a, a debate that will run and run. Okay, no, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, Samantha Stewart from Motherwell has asked if there will be any specific grants for directors of limited companies who work from home. So that's a, a, a real challenge, and it really is one that I, I think I've got a firmly park in, in in the responsibility of the UK government because they can obviously work with HMRC. Uh, we, one of the things that uh, has been challenging to us as the Scottish Government in terms of setting up schemes of support, we've got to use either the enterprise agencies or councils, as we've heard, to be the administrators of support. We uh, investigated very early on, precisely because we, think we also shared concerns about the lack of support for that particular group whether there would be access to HMRC to be able to run anything ourselves. That's not been um, possible or agreed by the UK government. And um, obviously, you know, you know, the directors pay themselves by dividends. And in the past, that's had advantages for lots of different reasons for them, but it's been problematic. Clearly, they are able to furlough, but as many will say to me, look, I just paid myself a minimal uh, salary, so therefore even getting furlough as an employee, if I put myself on the books, is very limited. But I do think that's something that um, the UK government can and should try and readdress. And um, those they've said it's it's too difficult. I don't think it is. I think if there's a will, there's a way on that. And remember, these directors they they are they're the generators of economic and enterprise activity. So therefore, you know that's something that you know really concerns me. But I I'm afraid I'm having to 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 play the place the responsibility firmly where, where it lies, and that's with the UK government. But I can say that we have uh, consistently, and I've done it directly in meetings like this with the, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer when we had some of the recovery uh, meetings with other Secretary of States in, in uh, UK government. I've impressed on him the need to try and address those that are missing out, that have fallen through the cracks of support. And uh, we know that's something that we continue to do. Yeah, OK. Uh, we, we... I touched on this earlier, but the, there was a question from Bill Patterson we, when we were talking about town centres earlier. We, we realised and we've said the pandemic has clearly had an impact 
on our town centres, closure of retail and hospitality premises. And Bill, his fear is that businesses will start to move out of cities like Glasgow due to less footfall and wonders if there's any support to help business owners to pay their rents. And he's asking are there wider plans to regenerate our town centres? And we, we, we started talking about that earlier. Is there anything more you, you want to say around that in response to, to that question? So in, in relation to the rent issue, that was something that you identified very early on as being problematic. Uh, and potentially really causing difficulties for businesses. Uh, obviously, they were getting support on a whole variety of, of areas within the sea bills, the bounce back, um, the if you're under you know some of the under uh, fifty one thousand the, the 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 grant scheme there. So, uh, but uh, for a lot of inner city centres, they haven't been able to recover because the footfall's not back in. And interestingly, although the Edinburgh has been in, in level three and the shops have been open. If you look at the footfall figures, you can see that actually it's still suffering. And until uh, Glasgow moved into level four, was was still the um, the, the most uh, impacted by by lack of footfall. So the trying to come to um, some sensible agreement and, and talk to commercial landlords in particular has been something that I've uh, encouraged my colleagues to do very early on. And again, I've refer to the, the Minister for Finance, Ben McPherson. He's been very good at trying to kind of marshal some kind of solution that would help commercial, the commercial rent uh, issues facing businesses, because obviously it's in the interest of commercial landlords to have a continued source of income. So therefore, you're know, being uh, overly, uh, I suppose, uh, harsh in terms of their expectations would not suit their interests. I think there's still a job of work to do on that going forward. But I, I think we've got to recognise, I don't think the city centres are going to be the way that they were previously. So one of the things we're looking at is um, the town centre action plan may have an impact because if you look at Glasgow, if you look at Edinburgh, they are a series of different communities within that. Edinburgh, is, as everyone probably knows, or if, you don't, if you're not from Edinburgh, it's a series of seven villages, for example. But there is something around looking at the uh, economics of the, the city centre. If we can't get, uh, if we can't get Office workers in? Can we do more in terms of uh, housing? Can we make it you know, return to people living in city centres, for example, to provide footfall and obviously uh, work for um, the, 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 the businesses themselves? So one of the things we we're, were looking at with the City Centres Alliance, which brings together uh, Scotland city cent uh, cities, uh, this is called sorry, the City Alliance, bringing together the councils representing Scotland cities, is to see if we can work with them to think collectively what that might mean, and also that might mean resources. But as I said, things are. I don't. I, I can't promise that. I don't have a finger as to whether we've got um, a, a pot of money. We will at this point in time we can use for that. But it would be the sensible thing to rethink what cities are, and and to to think about what additional support might be needed for either individual businesses to diversify, or indeed to generate more demand in some kind of way for city centres. Okay. No, thanks for that. Um, just coming back to the green economy uh, and the opportunities that might be there, um, Rona has been in touch with um, the National Unit and would like to know if there are any plans to create facilities so that waste and recycling could be processed at home, uh, and by which I think she means in Scotland, instead of abroad, yeah. and if this would be an opportunity for local businesses to take advantage of. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to to think more closely around the circular economy more generally. And uh, there are a number of companies that want to locate in Scotland that can carry out these facilities. But as with everything, we should be looking about procurement and what does that mean? How can we help support uh, domestic businesses to capitalise on those opportunities? So um, I do think, again, you know, my colleague, uh, the Environment Secretary, is very keen on this. I think people are really concerned from a global point of view, that we're exporting as, as much as we are. So therefore, the recycling domestically for all of us, businesses, but also um, in, in our households is, 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 is critical. But actually, how we then use that and that waste to heat, for example, hugely important. How can we find ways of uh, creating energy around that as well? So I think that is an area as part of the green recovery uh, we have to take very, very seriously indeed and look at opportunities. And, and a lot of these areas, particularly if it's either councils for waste, uh, where it's from the government, where it's from the NHS, for example, and we've shown how we use uh, procurement from the NHS and repurpose during the pandemic 
for PPE, um, and now we're, we're self-sufficient, uh, we've got the capability to produce what we need in Scotland of PPE because companies diversified into this area, we supported them to do that. I think energy and waste is another area where we can try and make sure that we use the, the procurement uh, uh, focus to, to, to be able to do that um, more domestically, but also create jobs um, in the process as well. Okay, thanks. Um, come back to the, you mentioned earlier, uh, digital, the importance of digital. So, and the, and the fact that businesses have relied greatly on digital technology throughout the last few months. So, quite a few questions coming in from people asking, what plans the Scottish Government has to deliver improvements to broadband across Scotland? And if there is any funding or grants available to companies so they can develop their business through digital technology, specifically to improve productivity and resilience in 2021? Okay, so we're touching some of this um, already, but if, if we're touching on the um, the, the, the the productivity aspects, that's exactly what the Digital Boost doubling of funding was in the summer and then just announced, I think, two weeks ago, the 30th of November, and another £12 million approximately, exactly to help companies um, improve their productivity through digital application. So yeah. again, that's something if people want to get in touch with Business Gateway, I'm sure you can you know, direct people uh, in, in, in where they can find that um, aspect. There's a digital development loan which enables businesses to borrow interest-free between £5,000 and £100,000 specifically for improving digital capabilities and digital skills. And uh, again, that there's a, a, a if you if you go on the, the fine business support, you, there'll be ways of, of identifying that. I think the websites will will be about digital development loan. That's what it's called. Um, in terms of uh, broadband, uh, you'll know that in terms of telecoms legislation, the UK government's responsible um, for co digital connectivity. However, we know it's absolutely critical for enterprise, and we're responsible for enterprise. So we have uh, you, not accepted. The, the limited uh, rollout uh, that was planned by the UK government, and we've invested £463 million, pounds, which is a considerable amount of money, which could have gone into other areas. But although it's a reserved area, we, we knew how critical it was. So the digital uh, uh, Scotland Superfast Broadband, extending fibre broadband to 95%, uh, has certainly uh, been delivered. And also then in terms of the R100, to get it to 100%, Again, those contracts have, have, have been set out. Uh, that the delivery, there's three key strands: is the 600 million pounds for the R100 contracts to do that final part in the, the north, the central, and the south of Scotland. And there's also a Scottish uh, broadband voucher in those places where we can't get fibre. And um, so we will, through this process, be one of the best connected places. Uh, even in Europe, in terms of uh, our, our rural geography and what we've managed to deliver. And we know that people can work, can, can work from anywhere. So how attractive is it to work in the most beautiful country in the world, but to be able to do so remotely? And um, so, you know, I, I, I am confident that we're in a place that will help businesses, but it's the practical issue about how do I help my company, but also how do I get connected? I hope I've managed to answer uh, those yeah. two areas. And, and obviously we need to make sure that people don't confuse the R100 number with the R number related to the COVID vaccine or COVID uh, virus. Uh, there are two different R's, people, so we just need to reflect on that. Don't get excited when you hear R100. I'd get very um, worried on the latter point. <laughs> so, <laughs> totally, yeah. totally. Just staying with technology and, and looking forward to, to new opportunities, Ian McKenzie from TechAura in Inverclyde has asked if the government has any plans to ensure Scotland is at the forefront of engaging with new technologies like artificial intelligence, automation and virtual and augmented reality? Yep. Well, the answer is yes, and, and we're world leading in these areas and uh, virtual and augmented reality, if you think about you know, Scotland, the, uh, the home of the fastest uh, selling entity and product, product of all time was Grand Theft Auto. If you think about how we've used, even in the heritage front, world leading, a, uh, and I've shared this with other governments, uh, some of the virtual experiences you can fly over Stirling Castle with Historic Environment Scotland's work. If you've ever been, visited the Bannockburn uh, Visitor Centre, that augmented reality experience, which was developed many years ago, shows you our capabilities 
Uh, in terms of that augmented reality, I know I was in Japan just over a year ago, companies keen to locate in Scotland because of our digital capability uh, for augmented reality in terms of films, for example, and how you can deal in that area. But on the big issues on data, um, clearly uh, the data lab work, The if you look at the Edinburgh uh, growth deal, for example, huge aspects of how do we work with data and to do so in, in, in a strong way to help in terms of business opportunities. So uh, the location of a data centre is was part of the advisory group on economic recoveries uh, recommendations. I strongly believe we need that to make sure the connectivity globally uh, allows us to then use that data in, in a very uh, intelligent way in terms of economic um, aspects. So data centres have to be very much part of our infrastructure response. So uh, remember I talked about that strength that Scotland has. You know, we've got the people, the skills, and we've got that range and depth of uh, different sectors where we are world leading. And certainly in the AI way, uh, in those different areas, we can do that. And remember in manufacturing, we've got advanced manufacturing as a capability in Scotland, the National Manufacturing Innovation Centre that's in um, in Renfrewshire, I, I increased the funding from that from 25 million to uh, 75 million over the summer to make sure we advance and pressed ahead with that because that will allow the digital capability to help in manufacturing for advanced manufacturing but also to help in that low carbon opportunity that Scotland can be in. So I think those combinations are, are, are strongly placed for Scotland to, to succeed. Uh, and I think it is part of our future, though I must say I, I you know, I, I have some variability in terms of what that's going to be. I quite, haven't quite got my head around driverless cars yet, but I'm sure uh, somebody will persuade me at some point in the future. Uh, interestingly, Uber have decided to get out of driverless cars. I saw the news report yesterday on that. Right. Um, I think we have time for just one more question, and that is from Elaine, who runs an events company, and she's asking if, in light of the vaccine, if planned events will go ahead in springtime next year, April, May, with reasonable numbers present? And if not, will events companies be informed now to avoid potential waste of charitable funds as they continue to plan? Yeah, I mean, that that, that is a, a real challenge because we don't know what the impact on the vaccine will have on spread. Uh, we, can, we know that it will obviously, as I, I mentioned earlier, have an impact on the hospitalisation. Uh, the, I actually spoke with the chair of the industry led uh, expert advisory, the events uh, expert advisory group, just yesterday, and uh, that is exactly what we're talking about. How do we get a route back for events? How can we plan? Because obviously the bookings of that has to be well in advance. Obviously, if we can get down the levels, you can have events, but they're not necessarily uh, able to be sustainable financially, and that's why, again, as part of uh, the support package that will be announced. Uh, obviously, we're looking to what further we can do with events. I use some of the culture consequentials to help the events sector because events are so important to Scotland. But we've got COP26 coming, we've got UEFA Championships in June, uh, and we want to make sure that we're in a position to support them. I can't give you a commitment that now, and it would be unwise of me to do so about April, May, but I know that people need a signal as to what would be expected or not. But it's just whether we can try and improve some of the indicators, some of the numbers in terms of the audiences, in different types of events, but it'll have to be done, I think, with the industry, and I'll work with them on that. Okay, that has been really helpful. Uh, unfortunately, everyone, that is all we have time for today. That has been a really useful run through, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for joining us today and for answering uh, those questions that we've had. And thank you, everyone, for the questions we've received. As always, we will make sure that. The resources that, that help you, um, and we've touched on a variety of different things here in terms of business support. Cabinet Secretary's mentioned Brexit. There are obviously that's coming, and we have the Prepare for Brexit website, and I would point people to that to, to make sure they're ready for it. But um, that, as I say, is all we have time for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you again, Cabinet Secretary, for your time, and uh, take care, everyone. Look after yourselves. Uh, stay safe. Bye bye.